This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best all-in-one platform for any of your website building needs. Hey guys, it's Celestia, and I recently had an epiphany. And by epiphany, I mean I was minding my own business, watching an endless stream of YouTube videos, as one does. When, out of the blue, my two brain cells decided to rub up against each other long enough to form what I might go so far as to call a compelling thought. This thought, as it turns out, led to a series of other thoughts, and before I knew it, I'd fallen down a rabbit hole of questioning everything I thought I knew about my own artistic process. See, I've been dealing with a lot of burnout out lately, to the point where I have so many big art projects that are both planned and ongoing that I've slowly but surely come to see art as an overwhelming, stressful, borderline exhausting chore that I have to do. Not that I enjoy or look forward to doing. And that's been deeply demoralizing because I made art my job out of a love for making it. So there's something uniquely upsetting about feeling that love gradually dissipate and be replaced by bitterness and dread. Burnout is something that the vast majority of artists deal with at least a few times throughout their lives, and is often something we battle consistently during our artistic careers with varying degrees of success. I've spoken about burnout before on the channel in both this relatively recent video and this very old video that I'm planning to remake soon. But what I've never realized, much less discussed before, was that there might be more to it than just the most commonly discussed causes. When we talk about burnout as artists, we often cite hustle culture, social media pressure and algorithms, oversaturated competition, and perfectionism as the biggest culprits behind its prevalence. And to be fair, they are. There's no denying that a significant number of artists end up burnt out simply because of the pressure to make and post high-quality art as quickly as possible, to please unreasonably demanding algorithms and compete for viewer attention against droves of other artists doing the same, or the constant comparison between our work and that of others pushing us to strive for impossible degrees of improvement, or the normalization of hustle culture teaching us that we should be trying to monetize our art in every conceivable way. There's a reason we so frequently tout those causes as the sources of burnout, because in many cases, it's not an inaccurate assessment by any means. But my two brain cells combined with a very interesting YouTube video made me realize that while all of those may be contributing factors to artistic burnout, the root cause might be a lot simpler and a lot more easily resolved, because there's very little we can do about social media pressures, hustle culture, or perfectionism. But we might be able to avoid burnout anyway by confronting the underlying issue that all of those problems exacerbate. So in today's video, I'm going to discuss what that issue is, how this one ridiculously common art mistake leads to artistic burnout more than any other, in my opinion, and how we can confront and avoid it whenever possible. But first, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace, a longtime partner of the channel. Regular viewers know very well by now that I live and die for Squarespace, because since long before I started working with them, I've always thought they were the best website building and hosting platform out there. What initially drew me in was their wide variety of templates, because my god is their library of them massive. There are pre-made sites that are so good and so versatile that no matter what kind of site you're looking to build, there's a professional looking, easy to customize template waiting for you on Squarespace. Whether you want to make a portfolio for your art, an online store for your merch, a blog for your community, or a site for your business, Squarespace makes it easier than ever to find the perfect template to build from and tailor to meet all of your needs. They're the same templates that I've used with confidence and pride to build my personal Duchess Celestia portfolio site and the site for my art studio, Royal Starship Studios. So when I endorse them this passionately and consistently, know that it's because they've earned that endorsement. Fluid Engine, their next generation website design system that I absolutely swear by, lets you use a smooth, seamless drag and drop interface to customize and edit every part of your site. And with e-commerce and print-on-demand integration, that includes giving you the power to turn it into an online store with none of the hassle that you might expect elsewhere. You can even sell access to exclusive content via members-only spaces. I mean, honestly, there's pretty much nothing you can't make your site do. And you can find that out yourself by going to squarespace.com slash duchesscelestia, linked in the description, and use code duchesscelestia for 10% off your first domain purchase. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, and please go check them out. All that out of the way, let's get into the video. So, as I mentioned during the intro, this magical art burnout epiphany came to me while watching a video. To be more specific, a Professor Viral video, because I have both an unhealthy interest in anime and exceptional taste. This video, linked in both the description and the iCard above, discusses something that you might at first glance consider to be thoroughly irrelevant to artistic burnout. AI. Not AI art, don't worry. We're not talking about that today. I've had enough AI art discussions in the past few months that the thought of another one right now is enough to give me a preemptive migraine. No, this video was about the commonly held belief that rather than taking jobs from humans, AI will just automate the simple, easy tasks involved in our work and leave us with more time to focus on the more complicated, effort-intensive tasks that require human involvement to be completed satisfactorily. And while Professor Viral doesn't necessarily dispute that claim, they present the very compelling counterpoint that the elimination of those simple tasks from the workflow of human employees may present more problems than it resolves. They argue that while AI may very well succeed at completing menial tasks and freeing workers up to tackle more difficult jobs instead, we as human beings need the balance of both menial tasks and complex ones to be able to function 
optimally, and a loss of the former might result in the latter becoming significantly more difficult to bear. They discuss the issue in much more depth than I'll be going into now, addressing the many issues more specific to a formal employment setting, so I strongly recommend going to watch it as well if you're interested. What's relevant to art burnout is the perspective they presented on demanding versus non-demanding tasks. In Professor Viral's video, working off of several studies, they describe the average human's workflow as consisting of a combination of demanding and non-demanding tasks. Fairly straightforwardly, a demanding task is one that requires a high degree of effort, attention, and time to complete, while a non-demanding task is one that can be completed with relative ease by comparison. To give an example, a demanding task would be to create a 20-slide presentation for your team at work or your class at school, something that would require research, information compilation, visual design, practice presenting, and hours and hours worth of effort and concentration. A non-demanding task would be answering your work emails, simple data entry into familiar spreadsheets, taking notes, or anything similar that, while still requiring effort, can be completed without requiring the entirety of your attention. A demanding task, per its name, demands all of your concentration and attention, whereas a non-demanding task can be done without forcing you to focus your whole entire brain on it. You can answer your email while also planning what you're going to do next in your day. You can take notes while doodling or listening to music. You could input data into a spreadsheet while also listening to your boss and coworkers discuss upcoming projects. Non-demanding tasks allow your mind to wander while you complete them. And while many have argued for ages that a wandering mind is the enemy of concentration, many others argue that it's the birthplace of creativity. In fact, one study linked in the description concludes that compared to a subject working on a demanding task, a subject working on no task, and a subject working without breaks, it was the subject working on a non-demanding task after a demanding one that experienced the most improvement in performance. To put it plainly, when you're stressed from working on a demanding task within your field, working on a non-demanding task within the same field might be even more effective than taking a break in terms of maintaining and improving productivity, because your brain is still engaging with the same material, so to speak, as is required of the more demanding task, while still being allowed to wander enough around the problem to allow more creative solutions to occur to it. If you're working on a complex math problem, the solution may not be to take a break and step away altogether, but to work on a simpler one of the same variety. Your brain is engaging in the same process as it needs to solve the more difficult problem, but requiring less concentration and attention from you and subsequently allowing you the capacity to consider different but related solutions. Furthermore, the completion of these non-demanding tasks gives us a feeling of accomplishment that motivates us to feel able and equipped to tackle the demanding tasks with more confidence and motivation. If we were able to solve the smaller problem, we can feel sure of our ability to solve the bigger one. This is even more helpful when you consider that larger goals and more demanding tasks take longer to finish, which means we'll have a lot less of those feelings of accomplishment than we do with smaller tasks, effectively supplying us with short bursts of accomplishment to supplement what we're not getting from the longer term goals of demanding tasks. Professor Viral posited in their video that by eliminating those non-demanding tasks and leaving them in the hands of AI, human workers will be left only with the demanding tasks that they find both daunting and exhausting, leading to, amongst other overwhelmingly negative consequences, massive burnout. That's because of something called cognitive workload. Bear with me, I promise we're getting to how this applies to art soon. As this article linked in my sources explains it, cognitive workload can be simply described as the amount of mental effort or resources required to complete a task successfully. When a task requires you to remember important details, do new things you're not practiced at, complete it within a limited time frame, or pay it your full entire attention, it contributes significantly to raising your cognitive workload, which does have a limit. There are only so many of those high effort tasks that you can do at once without overwhelming that workload, while less demanding tasks that are easier and more familiar to you can be completed without nearly as much stress. This makes it infinitely more important to maintain a healthy balance between demanding and non-demanding tasks in your cognitive workload, because having too many of the former can lead you to eventually feeling so overwhelmed by the enormity of what you need to get done that you feel like you can't even start. It's why people so frequently suggest that you break down daunting, complex projects into smaller, much more achievable individual tasks. If your goal is to publish an art book, for example, there are so many small but important things that need to get done before you're able to, that it might seem impossible. But if you you break those things down into a list, the art book is suddenly no longer one big insurmountable goal, but a series of smaller, less significant, but more achievable goals. So if your goal is to finish your entire art book, you're not going to derive much satisfaction from finishing each individual piece for it, because it'll feel like just another drop in the bucket towards that final goal. But if your goal is to finish one piece for the art book every month, not only will you feel like you actually have a chance at meeting your own expectations, you'll feel a sense of accomplishment when you do, because even if you haven't reached the finish line yet, you've successfully taken a step towards 
towards it. When it comes to cognitive workload though, it's not just about the perspective of goal setting, it's also about the technical balance of it. As we've established, people need a combination of demanding and non-demanding tasks in order to feel both healthy and fulfilled. Non-demanding tasks stimulate our brains enough to get us thinking about what we're working on, but not so much that our minds can't wander, allowing new and creative solutions to occur to us. Completing them gives us the satisfaction and confidence to feel more equipped and ready to tackle demanding tasks. After all, we're more inclined to think we can run when we've already proven that we can walk. So if that balance is so important, it also needs to be considered when we look at cognitive workload and the particular tasks that we break large goals down into. Going back to the art book example, there are a multitude of different tasks that would need to be completed in order for it to be published. You have to come up with the ideas, each individual piece would need to be sketched, lined, and rendered, those pieces would need to be organized in a visually appealing manner, you'd need to make a cover and forward and design your formatting, you'd have to find a printer and a place to publish and sell it, and so much more. Prior to examining my method of thinking as a result of Professor Viral's video, I would personally have organized those tasks in a very linear manner. Sketch a piece, line it, render it, move on to the next, repeat, and then get to those final, less important but easier tasks like formatting and printing and publishing at the end, once all of the other, harder work was already done. But that, I'm finally coming to realize based on the principles of cognitive workload, might not be the smartest approach. Which finally brings me to how all of this ties into art burnout. See, each of those tasks falls somewhere different on the scale between demanding and non-demanding. Finding a printer and making an online store to sell an art book on? That would take me a couple hours, tops, and would take little to no energy or effort. Finishing a few sketches that will eventually become pieces to be featured in it would also be low effort and high reward, because I find sketching relaxing and not particularly difficult. Line art, too, is a relatively low effort task that I find artistically satisfying but not notably challenging. Adding flat color falls into the same category. Rendering, though, is a lot more creatively taxing for me, and is the part of the artistic process that I find most difficult and draining. And yet, the timelines that I set for myself with my own art rarely take any of that into account. I'm working on a fanzine for We Happy Few right now, and because of how single-mindedly intent I am on getting it done before I can work on absolutely anything else, I've been spending absolutely all of my time on it. Regardless of how drained I'm feeling, my process is linear. Finish the sketch for a piece, line it, render it, and move on to the next sketch and start the process over again. But since I find rendering, at least in more complex pieces, so creatively draining, I'm effectively in a constant cycle of burnout because I spend the vast majority of time on a very demanding task, with only a few non-demanding ones to balance it out. With a more effective approach taking cognitive workload into consideration, I've been able to fight that burnout without actually working or accomplishing less. On days that I'm feeling particularly drained, I ask myself why. Am I feeling too daunted by the amount of work that still needs to be done before a particular piece is finished? Well, then rather than pushing myself to finish it anyway or taking a break from all of my work altogether, I could instead set aside the demanding task and focus on a non-demanding one instead. I'm still getting work done that needs to be done, and I'm also getting the satisfaction and sense of accomplishment that comes from completing it that will get me back the energy and confidence that I need to go back to the piece I was struggling with. For example, I needed a speed paint for this video, so I was working on a We Happy Few zine piece with a complex background and feeling overwhelmingly stressed because of how much detail and work would be needed to finish it in time. Before I watched Professor Viral's video and examined my approach towards demanding tasks, I would have forced myself through the rendering process anyway, regardless of the fact that it was bringing me no joy and sapping all enjoyment I was getting from the artistic process just because I knew I had to. Instead, I thought, okay, I'm drained and tired. What if I just let myself doodle? I'd still get the speed paint I need, I'd have some actual fun with my art again, and the completion of this non-demanding task would give me the energy I need to finish the zine piece. As a result, I now have a sheet of Bungo Stray Dogs guild members being dorks and the artistic confidence and validation to go back to the piece I was struggling with without all of that pressure and fatigue. Originally, when I was considering why I was feeling so burnt out lately, I thought it was because I was finishing every single one of my pieces and not giving myself the freedom to doodle or draw for fun. I thought it was because I was so rigidly conforming to this schedule that I'd given myself in which I have to finish this We Happy Few fanzine before I'm able to work on anything else, and that even when that zine is finished, I have two more projects planned that I have to rigidly complete before I can do anything else either, and I know that's a cycle that I have a tendency to perpetuate indefinitely. And to a degree, I do think that's true. A big part of the reason I'm burning out is because I'm far too rigid about my approach to what I'll allow myself to work on, because my neurodivergent brain screams in protest whenever I don't follow the strictest of schedules, and that sets me up to exhaust myself very, very quickly. And I can't really help that. I can work on it, but it's always something I'm going to struggle with because it's who I am. But the problem I had when writing that original script was that the takeaway would then have had to be to advise people not to pressure themselves to finish every piece they 
artist art and give themselves the freedom to draw for drawing's sake. And that's just not advice that works for everyone. For some people, finishing a piece is what they enjoy the most about the artistic process. And for some, even if it isn't, they don't have a choice. They, like me, might have professional obligations to finish their work and too little time to just draw for fun. So does that mean there's nothing they can do to fight burnout? In my opinion, the added perspective of cognitive workload in mind, no. It means each individual artist needs to carefully and introspectively analyze exactly what parts of the artistic process are demanding tasks and what are non-demanding, and find their own individual balance based on that conclusion. Because if you approach it that way, that's the one mistake so many artists make that leads to burnout regardless of any other contributing factors, spending too much time on demanding tasks and too little on non-demanding tasks. Viewed through that perspective, it doesn't matter why they're doing it. Whether it's pressure to keep up with hustle culture, compete with other artists, improve as much and as quickly as possible, or something else entirely, an artist's motivation for burning out becomes irrelevant when the technical basis for that burnout can be mitigated. The issue I've seen most is that when the topic of burnout is discussed, people frequently just advise artists to revise their goals. Going back to the art book example, many would argue that if you're feeling burnt out working on it, the solution is to just stop, or take a break, or put it on hold. But while that may be a feasible solution for some, I don't think it's the only one. Because regardless of your artistic goals, I believe that you can meet them without burning out by adjusting your schedule based on your cognitive workload rather than reducing it altogether. If you're feeling burnt out rendering a piece for that art book, you don't have to stop working on it altogether. You can just switch to another task that will contribute to it without burning you out further. You can brainstorm ideas for other pieces, sketch new ones, gather references, make mood boards, look into printers, plan the format. Whatever non-demanding tasks you can think of that will still give you the satisfaction of accomplishing progress towards your goal without draining you creatively or cognitively. And this really applies to every aspect of art. You can break down your creative process into non-demanding and demanding tasks, and based on how burnt out you're feeling, schedule it accordingly. That principle is why I can't advise you to just not finish every piece and give yourself the freedom to draw whatever to avoid burning out. Because maybe for you, finishing a piece isn't a demanding task. Maybe for you, it's your favorite part and the most rewarding aspect of art that motivates you to make more. Maybe for you, it's sketching that you find unbearably draining. It's gonna be different for everyone, so specific advice to avoid burnout just wouldn't be effective. Conversely, what I would advise is to introspectively examine what you enjoy the most about making art versus what you enjoy the least, and build yourself up when you're feeling burnt out by doing the parts that you like most, until you feel like you have the energy and confidence to do the parts that you don't. You don't need to conform to an artistic schedule that drains you. You don't need to sketch, then line, then render. You can work on 10 sketches at once until you feel motivated to render even one. You don't need to work exclusively on the big project that you're trying to finish. You can break up that process by doodling billionaire anime dudes buying worms on strings, and their snipers losing at Mario Kart, until you remember why drawing was so much fun in the first place. If you really want to avoid burnout, you don't have to avoid drawing as much as you are, unless you're really overworking yourself. You just have to spend as much of your time as possible on the aspects of drawing that you find rewarding, and minimize the amount of time you spend on the aspects you find draining, so that you eventually find a healthy balance between the two that allows you to most effectively allocate your time and energy. Finally, one piece of advice that I've heard a lot of people give artists dealing with burnout is to take more breaks and step away from art for a while when they're falling out of love with it. And for some, that may be very good advice. But the one thing that I have learned since practicing more mindfulness in my approach to cognitive workload and my creative process is that avoiding art in the form of prolonged breaks isn't always the way to rekindle that love for it. I was feeling so burnt out from that one zine piece that I was avoiding making any art altogether. There was so much pressure for that piece to be good that I felt so overwhelmed by self-doubt and fear of failure that I couldn't bring myself to draw anything at all. Continuing to avoid it and take a break was really only perpetuating that fear when what I needed was to confront it. Feeling like you can't do a demanding task isn't something that can often be solved by avoiding any tasks at all, and can in fact be significantly worsened by doing so. Reminding yourself that you can do the demanding task by doing a non-demanding one instead can be vastly more helpful. Drawing Edgar Allan Poe with his raccoon in his suit reminded me not only that I can, in fact, draw stuff with some degree of proficiency, but also why drawing is so much fun for me in the first place. And the moment I did so, I felt vastly more motivated to draw the more difficult subject matter that was the zine piece I was previously procrastinating finishing, because it didn't seem so insurmountable anymore. Avoiding drawing just made me feel more and more like I couldn't. Drawing something easier reminded me that I could. I'm not saying breaks are never the answer to burnout, but I am saying that they're not the only answer, and not necessarily always the right one if the reason you're burnt out is because you're feeling overwhelmed by the difficulty and energy investment of demanding tasks.
Ultimately, in conclusion, I feel like art burnout can be broken down into a much more manageable issue than it can sometimes feel like if you change the way you approach it. As cheesy as it is, balance really is the key to everything in life, and if you can mindfully and introspectively analyze what parts of art drain you and what parts fulfill you, you can, in many ways, successfully utilize that knowledge and understanding to tailor your schedule and workload to avoid burnout, or at least minimize its impact on you and your art. But I'm curious as to what you guys think about this. What have your experiences been like with art burnout? Do you think cognitive workload and resulting stress have played a part in it? Or do the social pressures play a bigger role? Please let me know in the comments below, because I feel like this is an incredibly nuanced topic that could really benefit from an equally nuanced discussion. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. Special thank you as always to channel members Joseph Solomon, TC Pratt, Zelda Deverack 42, Abyss Reborn, Hierarchy Kyle, Kinka James, Cutie Sailor Lovely, Justice for Asterion, and CP Lil Thing, as well as patrons Batman, Kyle Lowe, Blue Swanson, Cora Fear, Jimmy Shawalker, Alang Shi, Kim Yen, Crazy Asar, Gen Tong, Grayson Xavier, MG, Law Mage, DC Pratt, Finn, Grim Spectre, Celine Merriman, Ash, Eldritchia, The Stray Dog, Ulura, Greg Noble, Decagon, Jenny Chen, Captain Reku, Ryan M. Williams, Cat Bus, Alec Rynakainen, Mac, Lucy Amajiki, Selena Bibi, Electa Mike, Pride A, Totally Shogun, and Insomniac Sleep Schedule. And I'll see you in the next one.